And good morning once again. Welcome back to Viewpoint. Good to have you along for this very special show we have this week. We're actually outside of our studio. We're here in the governor's office at the State House talking with our esteemed governor this morning, Dirk Kimthorne. Good to have you with us. Thank you, David. Good for the invitation here. We appreciate that as well. Sure. You have had a very busy week. It's been a very busy week. You wow. said in one of your speeches this was going to be one of the toughest weeks of your life, or of your career anyway. Yeah, that's right. Well, because of the decisions that, that went into um, announcing the measures that I think are necessary for Idaho to get through what um, all the states are battling, and that is a national economy that's put us in the tank. Um, as, as tough as it is, Idaho's actually in better situations than most states. But we, we have to deal with this, and so I laid out a course that deals with it head on. Let's go back to the state of the state address you offered on Tuesday night. Uh, you know, that is typically the time when you come in and you say, here's how our state's doing, and you were pretty frank with lawmakers on Tuesday night. In fact, you unveiled your plan that night that calls for the penny and a half sales tax increase, the new tax, uh, extra tax on cigarettes. That's right. Talk about that speech. Yeah, and that's, uh, that, that's when I reference it, it's a tough decision. Um, for four years, I have cut taxes or provided tax incentives 48 times. In fact, I provided two more that night on Tuesday of my recommendations. So that's where I come from. I believe in, in limited government, and lean government, and efficient government. But because of this national economy, we have been hit like everybody else. And it has caused us to now have a $200 million gap that we have to somehow correct. We've already reduced spending in government by $200 million because before we ever think about suggesting increasing revenues through a tax increase, whatever the case may be, we have to make cuts. And so we've made dramatic cuts. Um, in many agencies, upwards of 10% reductions. And um, now we're at a point that we can make further cuts, but if we do, core services will be reduced. I do not want to, uh, to see higher education reduced any further. I did have to make reductions, 10% reductions in higher education. We kept public schools whole, but uh, again, I provided a, a maintenance of current operation. But I think that parents, uh, those who are seeking education, they want to know that they're going to have a good education system. And so this budget provides for that. Um, we also need to keep our bond rating. And we have virtually utilized every reserve of this state, which has allowed us to keep the, the budget in the black. It's a constitutional requirement. But now we're out of reserves. And I'm not going to push this problem off for another year. We, we have to solve it now. I had indicated Tuesday night that if we were to make up that $200 million gap, you're going to have to do some very extreme things. Uh, for example, you would have to close all of the county extensions office in, in every county. You'd have to close a number of departments, including the Department of Commerce, which has been so instrumental for rural Idaho in generating jobs. Um, even after making a series of cuts, closing the state parks, you'd still have about $65 million that you'd have to make cuts in education. I'm not willing to do that, and I don't think the public is either. Your uh, budget recommendation to get us through fiscal year 2003, which is what we've got to get through before we can start 04's fiscal year, um, includes taking some of that money out of the reserves, as we've talked about many times before, but it also includes starting that penny and a half sales tax increase May 1st, so we see one month benefit of that. $18.4 million, roughly, give or take. Um, we interviewed House Speaker Newcomb, and he said he doesn't think that's the way to go. And, and lawmakers, I think, are wrestling with this right now. Oh, sure. I think you've got a plan that seems to, to balance it out. What, what, what's the message to lawmakers right now? Well, the message to lawmakers is the fact that I, I've, I've laid out the case. I've identified a, a clear path forward. but to encourage them to now take the time necessary to look at all of the different options, the ramifications of this. And, and I fully expected that when I delivered such a tough message, there'd be a lot of them that would say, boy, I don't, I don't come to that conclusion. Well, they probably don't this week. But I think as the weeks go on and they begin to see where these different paths lead, uh, they will see that we're much closer 
in agreeing upon the conclusion. I mentioned the bond rating, mm -hmm. and um, that's very important. Idaho has the highest bond rating that a state can have. Only seven states in the union have that bond rating. A number of them have been downgraded, and 15 states have been put on credit watch, which costs your citizens millions of dollars in the additional interest payments that you would make. But the key with the bond rating is all local units of government, cities, counties, school districts, the bond rating that the state receives is their bond rating for local units of government. If we jeopardize that, that also is going to cost the local units of government. Let's talk about the upcoming budget year, 2004. You've laid out the plan for that area as well. And in fact, your recommendation uh, with the penny and a half cent sales tax increase in the cigarette tax revenue uh, actually puts some money back into those reserve funds. Let's talk about why you believe so strongly in putting some of that money back. Sure. We don't know where this economy is, is heading. We don't know what the immediate future will be. Um, I wish we could say that the national economy is rebounding and we're going to be climbing out of this. Nobody can say it yet. And so that's why you have a rainy day account. We've used ours because it's been raining. But we have to begin to build that back up for the whatever eventualities may happen. I don't know if this country is going to go to war. I don't know if we're going to see the, uh, the economy again plummet. We need to have that cushion. That cushion is what allowed us to get through 03 without calling a special session, uh, without asking people at that time to increase their taxes. Look at what the other states are going through. Look at some states that have had four and five special sessions. Uh, look at the dramatic cuts that they, that they have made. Now, we've made the cuts. Uh, I'll use as an example in health and welfare. Uh, Medicaid, which traditionally and was going to be rising 15 percent, we held it to 6 percent. Um, there's 150 fewer people that are working at health and welfare now other positions that have been eliminated there. We have saved the taxpayers $140 million in health and welfare, and yet the recipients are getting better service. Lawmakers have fought you before on putting money back in the reserves, and yes. I think that there's some disagreement there. And as they are digesting those details, how do you feel about that? I find it very ironic. Uh, as you say, lawmakers fight me on putting money back in reserves. Guess who put on the books? the reserve program, the lawmakers. Now, this was before I was governor. Um, but I remember my first year, I recommended putting $53 million, which would have taken us up to the 5%, which is the target. Uh, they didn't want to do it that quickly. I think now we all see that if we'd had even that additional cushion, that would have been beneficial. So I'm intent. It is just good, found, sound financial policy that you put some money into reserve to help you with a future that right now we don't know just where it's headed. Some of the lawmakers down uh, in the House and Senate have said and, and, and told us that, um, you know, that this sales tax increase, the proposed sales tax increase, is going to hurt rural Idaho, the low-income families. What's your, what's your Well, uh, when you talk about rural Idaho, if we do not find additional revenue, one of the things that we have to cut is the Department of Commerce and the Rural Development Initiative. David, I could take you through um, so many different counties and show you the different projects that are taking place that are a direct result of a rural initiative. If you take that away, that's going to have a devastating effect upon the entire economy of the state because rural Idaho is going to suffer dramatically. Also, I have proposed increasing the grocery tax credit so that it does help people. But um, uh, the sales tax also is the one tax that has been on a steady course. And if you go with a variety of the other taxes, it's 16 months before you see any revenue from that. With sales tax, you can get an immediate uh, return on that. And that's what we need. We need an immediate help right now to get out of this. You'd also, in your plan, uh, detailed uh, the idea that we would begin some of those construction projects once again because yes. we can get a bond apparently now, at low rate, make the first payment in 2005, and you say that's going to help put people back to work as well. Yes. 
We'd already proved two years ago major projects on each of our college and university campuses, so they're throughout every region of the state. Uh, these are programs, for example, right here in Ada County, uh, would be built there in Canyon County, uh, BSU West. We need to have that facility. North Idaho and throughout the nation, we have a shortage of nurses. This would be to construct the life science building at the North Idaho College so that we can begin to bring about additional nurses. Uh, if you wait, it will probably take us 20 years before we would finally build the last of those buildings. If we take full advantage of the low interest rates right now, we can build all of those buildings now. Uh, the debt service on that would be about $5 million, not from the general fund, but from the permanent building fund. The buildings would then bring value to us right now so that uh, students at the campuses do not have to wait 20 years. And also, it will create hundreds of the high paying jobs, construction jobs, and thousands of other businesses and associated uh, projects that would benefit from this as well. So I think it's a win-win opportunity for us. It's going to help education, but this is a true economic stimulus. As we are wrapping up here today, we have about three and a half minutes to go with the governor here on Viewpoint this morning. What other areas? Obviously, we were going to be hearing a lot about the budget and tax ideas and the economy and money throughout this session. What other areas do you look forward to seeing some progress made as lawmakers are heading back to work? Sure. Um, one of the things that we do have to deal with deals with capital punishment. We do have the death sentence in Idaho, but because of a U.S. Supreme Court ruling in another state, Idaho was affected by that. It, it is a technicality, and so we've developed consensus language over the past number of months that uh, once that language is passed by both houses and comes to my desk, I will sign that. That will correct um, the technicality because I do believe in the death sentence. I do believe it's a deterrent. Um, I do believe also that um, we need to have the path forward so that people can begin to once again know that we have a, a tremendous state. It's going to be one of the first states to come out of this this recession and uh, we're going to continue to see the creation of jobs. We're going to continue to provide a great education for our kids. Mm -hmm. And in fact as you look ahead and make your own path forward what do you say to the lawmakers as they are now digesting the details, looking it all over, hammering out their own ideas and plans, what, what's your advice to them? Well, my advice to them is, um, first of all, I can understand that the idea of raising taxes is unsettling. Should that be easy to do? No, it shouldn't. Did I have to wrestle with that? Yes. But I finally had to come to grips with reality. And so my advice to them is simply look at all of the numbers, from your legislative financial office, go through it with your staff, look at my numbers, look at the speech that I've given you because I've laid out what the reality is. Ours, I went through the list of facts. I went through the list of the fact that uh, over a majority of our agencies in the upcoming budget either receive the same dollar amount as they did this year or in fact less. And I really think that as they take the time, and they will, they're good people up there, um, they'll begin to realize we have to do something about this. If you just push the problem off for one year, that problem will just get worse. And, and that's not the course that Idaho takes. We're going to face the problem head on. We're going to have a path forward. We're going to deal with it. And we need to deal with it now. As we are broadcasting this morning, you will have just wrapped up the inauguration ball um, on the, after Saturday night. So uh, how do you feel about your next term here? You've got four more years coming up. I feel good about it. Uh, no question, these are tough times. But um, my word, what a, what a great time to, to be here. Uh, yes, we have challenges, but tough times never last. Tough people do, and Idahoans are tough. And they're also optimists. Uh, they're equal to the task, and um, we're, we're going to continue to be one of the leaders. And this week is over with. It's been a good week. It has been a good week. Governor Dirk Cameron-Thorne, thank you for being our guest this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you, David. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week, folks.